landscape urbanism guest lectures. Tonight, uh, speaking to us, we have Kelly Shannon, who comes from the Catholic University uh, in Leuven in Belgium. Um, Kelly has, uh, her, her work is, is very directly about landscape urbanism, and her work is, is very much concerned on that score with the relationships between, um, between design and infrastructure and engineering and environmental resources. Um, her work has a particular focus on water systems and on projects in the developing world. And it's on those subjects that she speaks to us tonight in her lecture, Water Urbanism in Asia. Kelly Shannon. Thank you, Doug, and also thank you to Eduardo Rico. Very nice to be back at the AA. Um, I was here last year, and I'm hoping that uh, I will be able to share with you some different projects than, uh, than I shared last year. Um, as Doug has mentioned in his introduction, I am going to be speaking primarily about water um, and the notion that the geography of human settlement has always been shaped very much strongly tied to the distribution of water. And to a certain sense, water and urbanity is, is completely inseparable. Water, as we know, is life-giving, but it's also more and more, as we see, it's life-threatening. And in fact, many of the rise and fall of great civilizations has a lot to do with the relationship to great water systems. So what I'm going to try to show is I'm going to try to briefly set a, a, some kind of a frame for the discussion. And then I will show a series of projects. Some are built, uh, very, actually one is built, most are, are not built, most are design research projects. But basically for me, I, I'm going to draw upon two um, theorists or two writers. Actually, Karl Wittfogel is a German historian. He actually did his doctorate in, in economics. And he was part of the so-called Frankfurt School. And he, he spoke a lot about the development, particularly in Asia, of an oriental civilization and how they require, especially in the arid climate, how there's a need for large-scale hydrology in order to keep systems working. Large-scale hydrology then needs a lot of people. It needs a lot of organization. So he started to liken the idea of hydraulic civilization to oriental despotism. So he started to speak a lot about bureaucracy, um, orders, political orders in relation to water structures. I will also be trying to draw a little bit on the writings of and a kind of categorization of landscape by Dennis Cosgrove. I'm sure most of you know his, his I, what I think is very wonderful writing. Um, and in one of his essays, he speaks about different kinds of landscape. He talks about embedded landscape. He speaks also about engineered landscape and somehow about imagined landscape. So to start with the first one about embedded landscape, for me this is very much about rereading existing logic in territory, trying to understand the indigenous intelligence, forgotten intelligences, in a kind of worldwide learning where we can address both global and local challenges. These are three, there, could, there are many examples, obviously, all over the world. But here it's very interesting, I think, to see the relation of a settlement in Indonesia. The size of this settlement is kind of clustered as an island amongst rice fields. The distance of this settlement to the next one has a lot to do exactly with the production that it can handle, how it can feed itself. The relation to the landscape is very, very strong. This is in China, in the Turpin Valley. So it's basically an oasis in the desert that's created by underground springs and gave a whole system and a whole way of living with the landscape out of necessity, basically. Similarly, in, also in Europe, in the Ligurian coast of Italy, there are wonderful landscapes of hillside towns. In this case, being tied very much to a productive landscape of olive and wine vineyards with very steep terracing for the, the production and the kind of nestling of, of urbanization in the crevice um, 
these villages, even today, are only accessible by train and by, and by boat. At the same time, looking at the work of someone like continuing this idea of an embedded landscape. So landscapes with the urbanization and landscape are basically indistinguishable from one another. I also draw on J.B. Jackson and his notion of a political landscape and a vernacular landscape. A, per a political landscape being very represented, say, by Venice, a landscape that, is, that we, as people intervening in the built environment, very much are, are working on giving order to systems making rules, making things that evolve according to a certain kind of prediction logic. And then, of course, other kinds of systems that are perhaps more indicative of vernacular landscape. For instance, when you see in Indonesia here, the difference between land and water, between the urban, the urban system, the natural system is very hard to distinguish, completely inseparable. And then also this whole notion that I will develop a little bit later, the idea of a sacred landscape where kind of architectonic pieces come down, in this case, to the Ganges River for, for a kind of celebration. Also, continuing about this notion of embedded landscape, um, in many of the Asian countries, there's, a, especially in South Asia, there's a whole notion of ghats. Ghats are, are connections to the water, the kind of mediator between land and sea, land and river. Often, these become vibrant public spaces. Um, with informal and formal activities happening along in the in-between area. This is the wonderful Dobi Ghat in, in, in Mumbai. So it's a public, public laundry place where the kind of water channel in the middle serves a series of tanks. And then also in Mumbai, you start to have something called tanks. This is a tank built in the 12th century, basically dug into the ground to collect rainwater to use during the dry season. And th today it survives, and this crazy um, city is growing around it as a kind of center of a kind of social, religious, and cultural center of this neighborhood. At the same time, in the midst of all of this relation of water, so very much water-based societies, hydraulic civilizations, things are rapidly changing, of course. There are new ecologies emerging. Here you're seeing a picture of Dhaka. Dhaka is um, a city that was built on the natural high ground of the river bank, surrounded by an immense area of low paddy fields. This is the so-called eastern periphery that's considered essential um, as a kind of ecological balance for the city. And it's being encroached both by informal squatter settlements and also by heavy real estate development. So all of this kind of funds for the city that's essential for its flooding mechanism is slowly being eaten by formal and informal development. Similarly, this is a picture coming from Mumbai in 2005 when they suffered a tremendous flood. As the impermeable surfaces of the city are disappearing, of course, the flooding risk is, is exponentially increasing. At the same time, this whole notion of embedded landscape is being quite dramatically challenged as nature continues to take her revenge. Um, here you're seeing Sri Lanka, a kind of before and after um, by the tsunami. This is the Sundarbans, so the, large wo the world's largest mangrove forest um, split between Bangladesh and India. This is uh, the, the picture of people in Sidar, which dramatically struck parts of Bangladesh. And the whole notion that Coastal wetlands, mangrove forests, protected coral reefs, and sand dunes are disappearing in the name of, in name of urbanization and progress. And therefore, uh, there have become huge environmental consequences and huge urban consequences in terms of flooding. Then we go to the second category of, of Dennis Cosgrove, the whole notion of engineered landscape. So landscape. Of course, man engineers landscapes. He tried to control them, tried to control nature. Um, and water, of course, demands human vigilance, always has. But what I find very interesting is that many of the, the things that we can look at also are more than, than simple utility. But at the same time, we're now stuck in a kind of paradigm um, that actually came a little bit from UK, you could say, during the industrial era where we, you, water used to be a structuring element in almost all of our cities. But as pollution and dead bodies were floating in the Thames, 
the idea to kind of hide it, to clean it up. The big stink was no longer uh, possible to keep. It was a health hazard, sanitary hazard. We started to put water under underground in pipes, kind of out of sight, out of mind. So the thing that used to structure our very city has now become an invisible structure that's not maintained, that's in the future not even working for our present needs. And at the same time, here you're seeing a picture of uh, Asia's largest slum, Darabi, um, where you're seeing these huge water pipes that are, of course, going to the pipe gated communities on the periphery and becoming also a, a usable infrastructure within the city. Um, but at the same time, we've had the shift. So we, we had this notion of the industrial era getting rid of water. Sanitation became the way we treated our water. Um, but at the same time, um, in, other, in other small instances in the margin, there were incredible opportunities. Here we're seeing a project by Frederick R. Olmsted, which was basically commissioned by the city of Boston as a health and sanitation project. It was given as a project for a very poor district of which there was disease. Um, and he was asked to make a project to kind of deal with the marshland. And in the end, ended up creating a beautiful uh, park system that simultaneously dealt with tidal wetlands, created a parkway, therefore rose the real estate value, um, and, and did a whole system. Ended up creating a whole system of urban renewal but a kind of engineered landscape that became a recreational landscape. At the same time, here you're seeing another kind of incredible engineering feat. Um, of course, the Netherlands, the um, incredible project of the Delta Works, where with um, engineering and money, they were able to create uh, a gigantic project, which I think is now interesting to, to understand that the official policy of the Netherlands is to actually turn back on hard engineering, go to soft engineering, and the slogan of the Netherlands now is to give more space to water. So they're talking about even breaking some dikes in places to build other stronger ones in other places. But this whole notion of kind of hard engineering is now being questioned towards a more ecological approach of engineering. Um, when we also talk about engineering and water, engineered landscape. Of course, I think there are very interesting lessons for us to learn, especially in the whole notion of what is landscape urbanism. I very much think it's not something new, it's something quite old, where we can revive some, some logic that once existed. Here's the incredible uh, pictures of the incredible civilization of Machu Picchu. There's many debates amongst archaeologists of why it was, why it fell as a civilization, but one of the hypothesis is that it simply didn't, didn't have any more water. That the whole system of how it was built also with a very ingenious system of, of water weirs and, and, and pathways to, to bring the, the water working with gravity, that at a certain moment it failed and perhaps the civilization failed with it. Another incredible civilization that's also very strongly relating urbanization, landscape and water is the Khmer Empire. Um, so this was built, as you see, very, very early. An incredible system of uh, temples uh, built into what were called barays, kind of huge reservoir tanks. And then a whole system, in addition to the kind of sacred landscape, there was also the pragmatic landscape of irrigation and, and the workings of the, of the fields. This notion of tanks is also something that was very well documented quite recently in a wonderful book by two Indian landscape architects looking at Bang Bangalore. Bangalore, we now know it as a kind of IT center, but once upon a time, it used to be called the land of a thousand tanks. It was an incredible system of collecting water that were all interconnected to use during dry season. And actually, of this thousand tanks, there are less than 100 left today. They're being filled in, they're being used for real estate, and there's no longer the maintenance of farmers and a kind of small scale system of reparation that made such a kind of network once possible. Another quite interesting system to show you in this regard is in, in Sri Lanka. So 
Salamanca is known as an island of nations, um, just off of the, the southern tip of India. And the very interesting thing about this country is it has a wet zone, and then it has a dry zone. But in fact, the, the ancient civilizations were all founded in the dry zone. It was only with the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the, and the British colonists that this became, um, the wet zone became colonized. But the Sri Lankans in their ancient civilization, and their very old civilization, they, they, they settled in this area, in the dry zone. And the way they did that is again by creating incredible tanks, incredible systems of water, places to hold water, and also incredible systems connecting the flowing flows of rivers. And the very interesting thing is that this system of water was tied then to a whole kind of Buddhist um, system and also a system for everyday habitat habitation. So you had everyday life appropriation of the water body, also with a ritualistic or religious meaning, and also with a very pragmatic way to, to irrigate fields. Here you see a very interesting system. These are now um, no longer working, all the ones with the dashed lines. The only ones that are still working are colored in black. But the system of sm very small, low-tech weirs, the Dutch claim, of course, that they're the masters of, of dikes and weirs, but in fact, the Sri Lankans were doing all of this much earlier. Um, and again, a very interesting system of how these, these um, different systems would, would be built and then tied into the natural system. Of course, it demanded a lot of maintenance, a lot of work of farmers, and a lot of this has fallen into, into disrepair. And finally, I get to the last category of, of Dennis Cosgrove, um, and this is where I will spend most of, most of the time for this evening, and it's the whole notion of imagined landscapes. So as you will see from the work I will present, um, it has a lot to do with my approach towards landscape urbanism. For me, landscape urbanism is somehow a resistance to globalization, very much following the ideas of, of Kenneth Frampton in that regard. It's, a resist, it's very much against the generic city of, of Remco House. Um, and it's basically looking at first interpretive mapping, making a lot of maps, trying to read logics of places, trying to understand places, and then to project new maps, to project new cartography, to make the research by design. The idea by ma mapping, mapping is a first step, I think, very much to transform a territory. And here I will leave you with a very, I think, nice quote by, by James Horner in an essay he wrote in a book of Cosgrove called The Agency of Mapping. I won't read the quote, um, but, but the whole notion that a map is the first step to transform a territory. We can do mapping from above, where we can understand landscape systems, and also from below, where we can really understand true field work about appropriation. And somehow using mappings and understandings of logics to restructure and to accentuate and to bring a new logic. But at the same time, as I say, for me, it's very much about, on the one hand, accepting, but also resisting tendencies. And somehow creating research questions that become a design. Also very much, as you'll see in the projects I'm presenting, it's also about building up a resilience. How to make cities not only survive, but to really thrive, how to deal with disasters, how to work with the forces of nature as opposed to against them, how to give space to water, how to choreograph floods. I'm going to be focusing primarily on, well, primarily only on Asia. Um, Asia's amphibious territories, I think, are very resourceful and efficient models for, for tackling contemporary water resource management, where you can begin to combine design, engineering, and water management. So I will show you a few projects in South Asia, and then I will end in, in Vietnam. So starting first with Sri Lanka. Again, you're seeing the map of the country, and what this dark line is, is it's a map of the area of devastation after the tsunami. So the tsunami, actually the area I'm showing you is only, is only here, between Colombo, the capital, Matara, the southern tip, and a very well-known city called Gaul. This area was not considered the worst hit. The worst hit 
is where there's currently a civil war. We don't really know what the effect has been there. There's a lot of trouble to get precise information. So the things I'm showing you are considered a place where it was actually not so much a big problem as compared to the other parts of the country. But it was obviously a huge problem. Lives and livelihoods were completely destroyed. Of course, there's always the challenge in such a context of how to deal on the one hand with immediate humanitarian relief, at the same time knowing often when you make temporary emergency relief, they become tricky. So of course, there's a paradox in that. We were looking at a project. When I say we, it's our Department of Architecture, Urbanism, and Planning as a, as a research department within, and a research group within our department. We had a project with the European Union to look at the effect of this new highway, basically that was connecting Colombo to Matra, a city in the south. It was a new highway that was going to be located on a kind of 100 meter high elevation escarpment that would then connect to the coastal cities. The, effect, the idea was that the Asian Development Bank gave Sri Lanka a loan and built, in my opinion, a highway they didn't need, um, but nobody ever studied the relation to the, to the city. So this was our, was our task. This is the city called Matara, and this is the city called Gaul. And these are the two that I will be talking about in this, this way. So here you see the highway line coming across Matara, Gaul, both quite old cities originally founded by Portuguese. They, they were actually, there were Muslim traders that used to come and in the river, in the rivers to wait for storms during a, during a trade route. But basically, it wasn't inhabited by, by Sri Lankans um, until, the, until the colonists came. Um, so what we started doing uh, is, again, this notion of mapping. Try to dissect, try to understand the logics of the system. So here is a very, very simple drawing of the different water systems. Again, here you see the natural bay of Gaul. This is the kind of historic city. And Matra, the city that's form formed again by another natural bay and a very large river uh, and a huge watershed area. And this line you're seeing is basically a, it's a 100 meter escarpment where the highway trajectory then comes through. So trying to understand in a, in a drawing that looks very simple just of water, to understand the kinds of water are very different. You've got freshwater lagoon directly in the inland of the coast, but also in the, in the territory itself you have, again, tanks that start to fertilize um, so with fishing and then are, are, are irrigating areas of paddies and then with higher elevation where you have nestled in the villages. At the same time, you've got wonderful beaches, um, rivers, and, and lagoons. There's a whole series of economies, formal economies, tur uh, tourist economies, um, but also informal economies. That, that, that completely complement the different kinds of water systems. In this instance, there's a very strange kind of fishing that occurs in this area. It's very particular. That's due to, to, the, um, to the tide, the underwater currents, where they get very, very small fish that you can only get in this part of Sri Lanka. So it's also a very particular area in terms of the kind of even the coastal waters not to nourish very locally, um, having, having meaning. Here's where you see an original kind of, well, the idea of a Muslim settlement that's nestled into the, into, the, into the rivers. The rivers are primarily not so much urbanized. They tend to be backsides. A lot of times they're almost even sewers. But at the, at the outlets where they're coming into the, to the sea, you do have small, small, um, small villages. There is quite a lot of local use um, in the smaller rivers, the less polluted rivers. So basically, we've been trying, we're trying to combine, as you see, always a kind of map, an aerial view, a view from above, from looking down, from understanding, from abstraction, and then at the same time trying to, to kind of ground that with field work and with uh, going by boat, going by motorbike, going by bicycle, walking in the landscape to kind of complement the view from above and the view from below. This is a map that we start to put together, and uh, it's always for us not just turning on and off layers of AutoCAD, but making relationships. You know, which layers do you put with which to tell which kind of story to eventually lead to a kind of design? Um, and the notion here of looking at the structure of the landscape and the infrastructure of the roads 
So beginning to understand different large patches of the landscape um, and the way they relate or don't relate to the new, to the new um, infrastructure that comes in. Again, trying to ground that in the kind of productive nature of the landscape, incredible rice fields, kind of coconut groves, and also places where you have um, sediment that's being used for the, for the construction industry. And from, from those kinds of readings, um, this is actually a, a group work of, of five students. So the research work and a lot of the base mapping was done by researchers in our department. And then in parallel, we worked with a group, I worked with a group of students to develop um, some projects. Again, this is work in the area of Gaul or Makra. There's this group of five students, uh, they worked together to make a vision for, for the whole area. And then they, they zoomed in on five strategic projects that they developed indiv individually, but always having to argue their case back of how their strategic projects fit back into this stronger the vision. The vision here of, of the group was to strengthen waterways as much as possible um, in every sense, also as transport, um, to give new life, new activities along waterfronts. At the same time, to increase the productive nature, to use these highway exits as places where you can have new coconut groves as entries into the city, um, and as well develop new, new urban areas in, in places that had a lot of sense, also working with projects in the pipeline from, from developers. This is a project, I'm gonna show you a project here and a project here. This is a project that's known, uh, the, the kind of Bay of Waligama. Waligama is, is apparently a, a kind of surfer's haven. Um, so it's, it's very, very good for surfing. The whole, the whole coast is now turned pretty much into signs for tourist places that say only foreigners kind of still like this is happening in such places. Um, but the tsunami wiped out quite a lot, so there's in some way an opportunity to think, to think anew. So the students here started looking at how could you use this kind of energy and, and kind of local, local entrepreneurship with the kind of global tourists to kind of try to put them more together instead of letting them live as two separate components, trying to combine on the one hand fancy tourism and then starting to mix it so that tourism is in sync, and then the orange is more public facilities, so at certain places trying to, to intertwine them more than they were. And she also worked very much with trying to create multiple waterfronts, so not just trying to talk about the use of the bay for surfing, but trying to work with the notion that you've got this winding river, and therefore you have multiple waterfronts that you can begin to allow development to happen here and very much try to, but at the same time, give protected areas because a lot of the fishermen were, are now afraid to return to the sea. So you could start to create pl um, places where they can still be close to the water, but more protected. Another, another student worked in this area, the city of Matra. He developed a very interesting story of trying to revive the river as a, as a, as a backbone of the city, as a core of the city, instead of the backyard of the city. And he had a whole story of trying to develop a series of programs um, that also worked very much with, with different um, elevations, different platforms, different heights, but then could allow the kind of choreographing the flood to allow it to happen different areas along the river. Here is the new highway. He built it on a dike that would continue. And here is where he would build a whole new big platform, a kind of commercial office high rise building to catch your attention from the highway. But immediately on the other side was a, was a reservoir system that would deal with this huge watershed that floods quite often during the different seasons. And he kind of made a system of how you could choreograph this with the different levels of the water that would come over the seasonal fluctuations. So now jumping to Bangladesh, remaining um, still in a very, very watery landscape. Um, so Bangladesh, uh, the area I'm going to be showing you is here. So the largest city is, of course, Dhaka. Chittagong is the second largest city, and the third largest city is Khulna. Um, I went last year with a group of, of students to, to Khulna, and we worked trying to look at both the city and the larger territory. 
this area that you see here is actually going into this part of India. It's called the Sundarbans. That's where I showed you the image before. It's the, the largest mangrove forest in, in the world that's being uh, slowly depleted um, by, by various forces, um, also by economic forces and by urbanism itself. So the students tried to look, as I say, both at the city scale and at the regional scale. I will only show you the regional scale, scale work. Um, but the very interesting thing is that this, this city, as in most of the region, is very much changing from a water-based city, um, and in this case, train. It was, it was an incredible um, producer of jute. Uh, the industry has now, has now fallen. It's a post-industrial city, in fact. But this whole system of, of, of boat, water, and train is now, is now falling, um, falling aside. And what's coming is roads, again, built on the money of Asian Development Bank, World Bank, huge uh, infrastructure um, cutting across the territory and completely changing the whole nature of, of settlement. So this is actually the, the area of the city where I was just showing you those pictures. This is the new big highway that was designed. This is coming down to another port, and this is the, the Sundarbans. As you see, this is a drawing of the, um, so here you see the system of the waterways in blue and the system of the roads in red. And as you see, most of this is light blue. In fact, because it's all a watery mosaic, it, it is a wetland territory. The urbanization that sits on this kind of thing is, is highly, it's very, very dense. It's a rural um, system but it's, it's very dispersed, and it has a very strong relation, in many cases, simply to the, to the water network, sometimes not even to the road network. But of course, as this larger infrastructure system is being imposed, the relations and the systems of urbanization are, are dramatically changing. So our students, what they did is they started to look first um, at what, what, are, what are the tools? How, what are the logics, what are the problems, and how can we address them? So one thing they said they know we need, in this part of, of Bangladesh, they have an incredible problem of water. I mean, they have more water than anybody in the world, but they have no clean drinking water. <laughs> it's really a kind of paradox. So they have too much, but they don't have any of the right kind. There's a huge amount of arsenic poisoning. They've dug into wells uh, too deep. They have gigantic problems. Um, people uh, have a lot of health problems related to water. So the students were on the one hand starting to look at how can we purify water, how can we also start to create water systems that clean but that also perhaps become part of a public realm. Um, and this you'll see a project later. This is a project that the Belgian government built in Vietnam that they analyzed to try to understand the logic. So the first thing the students did, they started to look at what are the tools we have to operate with in order to, to use landscape as a way to guide new urbanization. One of them was water purification. A whole other idea they had was, was to build on existing programs that were in the Bangladeshi government. On the one hand, of afforestation. There are incredible afforestation programs to begin to, to replant millions of trees. And also the notion of social forestry um, is something that developed in, in Bangladesh. It's, it's incredibly interesting. They'll find patches of land uh, um, kind of Turan Bag, and they will have it kind of coordinated that it operates as an ecological system, but they have people take care of it. You kind of adopt a tree or adopt an orchard, and you, you get the money from that fruit. So it becomes a system of employment, a system of maintenance, and it's become a very developed, um, interesting social program, employment program in Bangladesh that's now being exported um, throughout much of Southeast Asia. So they tried to look at these two things together and trying to understand how this could be used in an ecological sense, but per potentially also as a new kind of um, economic generator, and at the same time as a way to kind of deal with, with erosion and to deal with regenerating waterways. And the other, the last kind of, say, toolbox that they had, which came from reading the existing processes, was trying to understand like we've got gigantic amounts of sediments that are being carried basically from the Himalayas that then wash through Bangladesh. Um, and that somehow these sediments can be used 
um, can be directed, can be put in barriers to, to move the sediment, to, to form land on the one hand, um, to make, to also use it for agriculture, to make bricks. So, so they were trying to look at how you can intervene to kind of catch sediment um, and to combat erosion um, and to use the two processes in a way that can be valuable for, for guiding new urbanization. So just very briefly, these are some regional strategies they had. One was to begin to say, okay, we've got a road system coming. Um, that's inevitable, it's also necessary. But at the same time, can we start to create a new hierarchy and change the system of water? So at the same time as we're building roads, can we also dredge some of the waterways? Can we make systems that work? So to kind of have a parallel system of blue and red, where the two work as a complementary system. So that was one idea of creating an entire new hierarchy where you balance the road base with the water base. And at the same time, kind of uh, sticking onto the, to the water system became a whole system of, of reservoirs, uh, areas where there were already natural depressions in the topography where they could say, this cannot be urbanized, where we, where we kind of flood it to allow, allow places to catch, uh, to deal with the incredible increase in the severity and frequency of storms that they're getting to deal with the issue of, of flooding. At the same time, they had the, another kind of strategy was, was this notion of afforestation. So they had the idea that these huge, um, well, along the, the major waterways coming in, that the, area, the areas could be heavily afforested and then smaller kind of bands of, of afforestation could follow the smaller waterways, um, providing interconnectivity of, of kind of green space, but also working to kind of keep erosion um, from, the, from the banks. And so in the end, when they started to put these different systems together, so you, the afforestation in this kind of blue-green, the green, the reservoirs, they started then choosing places in the bright red where they said the government should in invest in social infrastructure, in schools, everything but what the private sector is doing so that in certain nodes you encourage certain kinds of, of public investment, social infrastructure that graft onto the road and the water, the water network. We had one woman who, who then worked, uh, she has a thesis project, she worked on this new highway that's coming how, how to make it that the water system could still survive and have a logic. Um, and she started to work with the notion of the water system being a purification system. By flooding things immediately along the highway, you avoid this kind of strip, strip uh, urbanization, ribbon development that naturally comes, starting to make systems where you could graft onto the existing um, rural structure and start to have a new kind of quasi-urban density, this kind of idea of a rural metropolis or an urban countryside where you have a kind of well-serviced but high density but still productive, a very productive um, rural territory. Now I'm switching to, to India. Um, I will also go quite quick because most of the time I will spend on Vietnam. Um, in, in, in India we were working in the city of Mumbai Again, this was a group with a group of 11 students. Um, what was very interesting, initially the project that they were, the assignment they were given was to look at the mill lands. So there's a whole series of mill lands, basically in this area, that are, have, um, are, no longer, are no longer used. I mean, they boomed during the actually American Civil War and have since then been in a state of decline. Um, they're now being turned basically into shopping malls. Most of them look like windows and horrible. And the next big development project that's coming up is um, the Docklands, the eastern Docklands. So there's a whole area that used to be military and port areas um, because the port is now moving to Navi Mumbai. It's gotten out of date. This entire, actually one-eighth of the island city's um, outline will be given up to the, to the market as a kind of new development area. So the students started by first looking at old maps, trying to understand this. Very interesting thing about Mumbai, I think, is this map that the students started to compile. In red are the islands. So Mumbai was originally seven islands. 
that were then kind of a series of processes, of processes over the years of reformation that turned it into a kind of solid producer of what we know today. So these islands were progressively reclaimed, um, and this is a map you're seeing during the British era. And then even per the reformation of all this kind of docking stuff has, has happened since then. It'll be interesting to keep your eye on that area as the students in their design come back to, to this kind of formation of the, of the seven islands. So kind of again, this the process, these actually drawings weren't made as part of the studio, but made for something afterwards. But very much the process we're looking at, both the students and ourselves, is trying to kind of understand the growth of cities, understand their logic in those times. Um, here, going from seven islands, ending basically to a highly congested peninsula that had uh, north-south connections and otherwise no more place to, to grow, no more place to meet. This is the landscape of these vast areas of the mill lands. The, the mill lands, um, incredibly uh, beautiful, actually. Many of them are, are incredible, beautiful buildings, um, many of which have, have heritage value, but many of which are, I mean, it's a lost battle. There were huge court cases, very complicated stories. But basically, it's a battle lost, and they're, they're now being eaten by, by real estate developments. Um, so actually, the students had to look at this, but this battle is kind of almost already gone. Um, but at the same time, starting to learn lessons from this of how we could deal with the eastern docklands. So the eastern docklands you'll see here, basically all of this area is soon going to become, well, and this area is soon going to become um, real estate sold to the private market. So um, here the job was quite incredible because the students had no maps. These are all maps that they made by placing Google Earth. <laughs> Thank God for Google Earth. When we went back to Mumbai after the show, these the students said, can we have your maps, please? Yeah, they are right there. <laughs> but they, they made some very nice maps, always looking at the same thing. So landscape, infrastructure, urbanization, and then a proposal. So here you see what's very nice. OK, my cursor is red is the water. Pink are wetlands, and, and this gray is mountains. So it's very logical to understand, of course, that the urbanization goes around the mountain. The infrastructure also goes around the mountain. Um, and then they started making proposals that I won't go into at this scale, but about where to develop um, on the other side of, of the, the bay. So this is, uh, say, greater, greater Mumbai. They did the same exercise um, at the, what's called Southside Island, um, showing slightly different things at every scale level when they changed. So here what you see is gray is always urbanization, but the blue are all the slums. So you begin to see different, you map different things. So the, the, the slums were, were also seen in relation to the landscape to try to understand, is there a logic to what is there? And finally, they came to the island city of Patel. Um, and here you see again the placement of the original seven islands. Here in blue are the mill lands. So all the mill lands that are going away and the docklands. So this was their site in fact, and eventually their proposal. Um, their proposal, as you see, is very simply drawn in red and blue. Red is basically development by the state. Blue is development by the private sector. The notion is you need a public-private partnership. The red would be social infrastructure. It would be uh, housing projects. It would be education facilities. But it would also be very, the key, most beautiful spot on the waterfront would be for Mumbai, Mumbaiers. It would be uh, given to the public realm, but at the same time, this area, again, going back to this notion of the seven islands, a new waterfront was created to even give more waterfront development for private investment. They then did things like this is the existing situation. This would be a scheme of the, the tendencies continue without them. And then if you hire them, this is what you can get. You get more wetlands. You still get development, but you get also much more. It's very important to see this bottom line which is less asphalt and kind of more places for water to go into the city. So here's a, one drawing of the strategic project, say, of the waterfront, the docklands, where the blue is given all this blue is given to private developments, where the red points of different projects are given to the public realm. Very clearly seen here. So the public realm, the city has to invest in this. 
but these are what pay for it. Their inevitable will come, so we can make do. Similarly, here they restore some of the some of the very beautiful heritage, the post-industrial heritage legacy, uh, turn it into a happy school, but at the same time needing to get the money from from the the big bad developers. And same story here. Here the public realm is simply a promenade, but then this other stuff is inevitable and will happen. They also had one project. Uh, they again worked as a one big office. There were 11 students together, and then creating strategic projects. One of them was to try to kind of work with this sinking wetland and also trying to turn part of this wonderful coast not into a garbage dump but into a, a sea asset. So they developed also a project, this very strategic point, is kind of the beginning of trade what's called the island city. Um, this is that, that, that slum, this is the body. And, um, so what they did is along the railway line is where they put a lot of the red stuff, a lot of this social program. These rail lines aren't needed so much anymore with the English be gone. The territories are quite big, so these could be taken over in very strategic places for public facilities. Or on the other hand, public uh, private investment so the blue could also happen in key places, but there would somehow be a balance. And all of that blue would help pay for a kind of restoration of this corridor, um, which is really essential because there's a, a river here called the Mickey River that's been basically reduced to a, a small creek if you can find it. It's really a, a horrible thing. So the idea is to restore this water, this creek as a, as a creek to start to alleviate some of the problems of flooding. And then for each of the projects, they started to develop in stakeholder coalitions where they started to try to understand and try to unravel. Uh, the people in Mumbai laughed at a little at us because they said it's a bit complicated to understand for them how Mumbai works. Uh, and for us, they thought we were brave but still didn't get it right. Um, trying to understand the public sector the private sector, which agencies, and here the kind of increasingly important um, civil society structure, the environment group that's having some influence. So now I will go to Vietnam. Vietnam for me is a place where I've been working for, for many, many years. Um, and it's a, it's a really wonderful place talking about landscape urbanism, talking about water, about rapid urbanization. It's the second economy after China. It beat India last year in terms of uh, economic growth. Um, it's suffering, of course, now. But uh, anyway, it still serves in the head. So it's changing dramatically. But what I find very beautiful about this map is it, it's a map of the country. It's a map of the country from 1490. And the country used to be called Dat Nok, which means land and water. That used to be the name of the country. Uh, and, and the map represents simply and only the waterways and, and the mountains. These are, these are some very old maps of uh, Hanoi, so the capital. It will be celebrating next year its 1,000 year birthday. So it was an it was a imperial city, a capital city, um, that was based very strongly on the principles of Feng Shui with the rivers in relation to the mountains. And the drawing of the, the map very much reflects the kind of whole ideology, the whole cosmology um, in relation to, to Feng Shui. Um, at the time, it was very much to many, many, Vietnam has, has had many impositions, uh, Chinese, uh, French, American, Soviet, and now the free market economy, um, and that are all somehow readable in the, in the landscape and in the urbanization. But until even just a few decades ago, it was Hanoi. This is the city of Hanoi. This is the, the Red River. It was very much a river, a river city. Um, it had a lot to do in terms of its whole economy, its whole production, its whole kind of relation. Um, and that's now dramatically sh shifting. Um, again, the first time it switched is when the French built a row, uh, bridge just off Eiffel, I think, there's a bridge here. And it changed the entire um, meaning of the city. The road-based urbanism came. 
these are not all bridges that are there yet, but they're bridges meant to come. There will be a city of seven bridges. And the things you're seeing in purple are now these uh, export processing zone, industrial zone, so it starts to change from a kind of very agricultural water-based city toward a, I would say, um, almost even post-industrial, jumping the industrial era from a kind of agricultural to post-industrial system. These are the kind of, this is Hanoi, and this is the envisioned Hanoi by uh, Paul House, Nick and Fletcher, FOM. They've got a lot of awards for this project. Um, on the north side of the river, which isn't being realized anymore because now they have the idea to go to the west because this didn't work with Feng Shui. Actually. Um, but this uh, kind of generic city building where you have uh, east and west somehow coming together, this is in the propaganda of Kor House actually, I think it's worth coming to see. Um, luckily this project is But at the same time, what's happening in this, in this country that's had this wonderful tradition, you have foreign imposition, but then in their own planning departments, now that they have kind of freedom, uh, this is what they're doing. This is in Hanoi, but it could be anywhere. So now you have choice. You know, for a long time in Vietnam, you didn't have choice. It's still socialist, but it's like trying to make socialist and politics put the market in the economy. So now you can have a small house or a medium house or a big house. And you always have some green, you have landscape, and you have water. But of course, it's, it could be anywhere in Vietnam and China. And so this is really blanketing the, the territory. At the same time, what's very, very interesting for me to understand about Vietnam, this was published by the, the World Bank. Um, actually, the, kind of I think also paradoxically, the same people that are building a lot of infrastructure along their coast, they're saying the coast isn't going to be there. So this is a little bit uh, spooky. But this is a, a diagram of, in Asia, the impact of urban expansion. Basically, Vietnam is a, is a, has very little of the country that's flat and easy to build on. It's coastal. Um, and the, out of all the countries in Asia, Vietnam is, will suffer the most um, in terms of the rise of sea level. So the amount of urban population that will be affected. Vietnam is now 87 million people. So the, the percentage um, of the urban extent that will be affected by between the one and five meter flood is, is quite high. Only this past November, they had, this is, these are pictures from Hanoi. So um, in the Mekong Delta, this is normal. In Hanoi, this is not normal. The, the, the roads, this is a big road, and this is a, the protective dike is just out here, right? So it completely uh, flooded. It was, it was the, lar the, the biggest floods they've had ever in, in Hanoi. So of course, with climate change, um, there's incredible um, consequences. Uh, there's a whole notion that's rising now, the idea of climatic refugee. So people are going to have to move from areas that are that are be affected and therefore going to cities that are already underserviced and overstretched. Also, there will be very ineffective infrastructure because most of the infrastructure is developed along the coast and huge economic consequences. And of course, the most vulnerable are the coastal cities, the deltas themselves, so both the Mekong River Delta in the south, the Red River in the north where Hanoi is. And of course, the lowest economic class will also suffer the most because they tend to live in areas that are more susceptible. Um, so in terms of what we need to do, we need to increase resilience and decrease vulnerability of our cities somehow. Um, and the idea is to integrate modes of in infrastructure, engineering, management, etc. So I'm going to try to show you some work from Vin, and then Kanto, and then Ho Chi Minh City. So we were in Hanoi before. What you see here is it's mostly mountain, a lot of mountains, and then the deltas where there's huge population, and then a very small kind of skinny area on the coast where most of the cities are located. And I will be showing you Vin and Kanto. So Vin, Vin is, uh, used to be, this used to be the southern boundary of Vietnam for 1,000 year history. It was kind of the southern stronghold because this was basically mountainous and swamp and it wasn't very much habited. There was a Vauban uh, military uh, citadel 
It was that served more or less as a, before the conquest. It served as a feudal administrative and a military center for uh, being the kind of southern boundary of the country. But this city is actually one of the cities that's had more devastation than almost any you could imagine. During the First Indochina War, so the colonial war, the Vietnamese burned it themselves to not let the French have it. I mean, it's, they say it's the reddest part of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh is from here, and most of the many important uh, members of the present Communist Party are from this province. It's the poorest province in Vietnam, it's called Mai An. Very, very bad soil conditions. And then in the Second Indochina War, so the Vietnam War, which they call the American War, um, it was leveled because it was the head of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, who were the Viet Cong were infiltrating through the mountains by Laos to the south. So the Americans kept one building standing simply to know where to drop more bombs. So it was uh, completely uh, flattened. And then it was rebuilt, and it was twinned with East Berlin. So uh, they were given a gift by the former GBR of the kind of city of socialist man, where they had these incredible buildings and people in Vietnam and even extended families, food families, uh, where these assistance minimums doesn't work. And as well, it's tropical climate. I mean, they didn't have enough uh, steel when they were do they simply did this. So the the joke is that they were pre-dilapidated. I mean, they were really kind of uh, it was a very very sad state. They're still the pride of the city. They still are there. I mean, they politically, they they still have and culturally they still have a lot of meaning as, as a gift. But what's happened basically in 1986, uh, Vietnam changed their policy and very much followed uh, China. And they opened, they had something called Doi Moi, which is kind of open door policy. And everything's changed. Uh, before Vietnamese were told where you had to live, so suddenly residence permits became free, people were free to move, people started running to cities, of course. And then this kind of free market economy started booming. And you started getting this kind of train sprawl with what they call European villas. So in this city, there was very little to, to grasp. It's not a beautiful city like Hue or Hanoi, where you can catch something wonderful to structure it. Um, it was kind of sad and difficult and kind of bland, horrible city, actually. So to understand how to catch something, um, the investigation, and this is this was part of my own actually PhD research, was to try to look at the landscape itself and understand very subtle differences of height that actually make all the difference in the world. In terms of this is Highway One, so this is the national highway that basically connects Hanoi to Saigon, and and sometimes it's only one house deep urbanization, and then immediately an incredibly rich, productive territory behind it. So this is again a tracing of a of a aerial photograph. So the South China Sea, which I'm kind of having a virus problem. Um, the South China Sea is here, and this is a river. And this is a figure ground drawing, but the figure ground is meaning that the black is simply one and a half to 1.7 meters higher than the rest. So, you know, so you start to get a system where you have urbanization and then this kind of sea of, of quite beautiful lowland. It ended up happening because there's mountains here, so the water is running, create naturally creating this pattern. Uh -oh. It's one logic of how this land is formed, but the other logic of what's happening is that man is slowly, to build the city, is filling in the lowland to make high ground. So that's inevitable, but how could we perhaps consolidate the filling to, on the one hand, recreate a, a system, an open system where the water could flow, in this sense, recreating the citadel as a void, an open space, creating, connecting some of their open spaces, and also to kind of begin to make larger tracks, because this is all productive land, but the, the way of productivity has changed. It's gone from the individual, usually woman, bending over, doing rice, to a more mechanized system where you need larger territories for a different economy of scale. So the idea is to start to get larger open spaces, but at the same time, larger high land platforms. The idea is then one of these platforms in the rural area, the reason this area is very bad is because there's also something called the dry halt 
loud wind. So there's a wind that comes from this side that makes the city very, very uncomfortable in the summer. So the idea is on the kind of very bad side of all these platforms to make productive orchard fruit trees um, in this kind of sea of otherwise productive rice, to have simple infrastructure on the, say, favorable side, public platforms for different informal activities and rice drying, and then to have the housing and on the land some sufi higher ground that the builders could grow vegetables. You don't need to be in, you can't grow vegetables in the water. So the idea is that what you see in the back is the, the kind of fruit forest, then the, the urbanization, the sea of rice in between. This is the simple infrastructure and these kind of platforms. So those platforms are, are these things where then you have different activities that can come and happen in this area. So informal activities and rice drying is, for instance, the place that they usually now do in the road when you can get them in the road. Similarly, a mapping. So again, going back to this idea of mapping of the existing condition, the condition of productivity. And this is National Highway 1. Um, this is the railroad. Then this is the productive land of, of the higher ground where you could potentially have agriculture. Uh, and then all the light green is rice. There's a lot of brick making at the confluence of the river, and of course quite a lot of fishing in, in this area. The idea is to again eponymize, to work with creating more productivity, creating huge forests uh, at the city scale, moving the highway, which is the plan of the, the city. Smaller, these are always the forests, and then somehow using this strong wind also as an energy generator. So here you have the entrance on the highway one, coming by the kind of, say, city scale productive forest with the, with the wind still down there. Similarly, the water system basically is a system of trying to, 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 to make the missing, the missing gap and to then turn that into a system that could also start to work as a public transport system of water simply by providing platforms, platforms when you have crossings of road and water. Very simple, low low cost, low tech infrastructure to allow activity to, to happen. This is the master plan um, for the for the city. So the city's approved master plan and the kind of industrial area with uh, the fishing and the kind of say council proposal of areas of density and then the lower areas of uh, rural urban kind of strategic project that came along with this. This was a market, um, an existing city market that we tried to re, this was a project done with UN Habitat that overlapped with some few uh, Jewish seaware. Um, a market, we did a reconfiguration where you turn the back market, which is now a dump, a sewer, uh, and a garbage dump and really horrible, you turn it into a new kind of front. So you have both a water and a, and a road-based market area with informal stalls Similarly, the entrance to the city from the south across a bridge. Right now, there's a very beautiful mountain, and basically, it's a nondescript uh, area with no development. There was a lowland here um, that we decided could potentially be kept, but still, the city could have start to have a waterfront in it um, on both sides of the river. Of course, the administrative boundary in Vietnam is always in the middle of the river, so nobody thinks about riverfront as having two sides. Um, but we said, no, that's silly. You should think of two sides of your river, make something as an entrance, but at the same time, allow the area behind to be a reservoir for, for water. So as to make your buildings that you can also have, the buildings on the waterfront can also very simply deal with water, where you start to get something um, as an idea that at least you begin to have an entrance, a gate to the city, to a river-based city. So if we go to Kantro, Kantro is in the south. Um, it's, quite, it's about twice as large as Jin. It's a, also a very beautiful uh, landscape. It was a landscape that was basically a swamp until the French came. The French made huge engineering work that made basically a swamp into a, one of the most productive um, deltas in the world. This, uh, also, the original urbanization pattern had very much to do about the waterways, clusters of, of urbanization along the water, then with orchards, and then with vast expanses of, of rice. The, the whole work, the whole place exists as it does now because of the 
different infrastructure there. Still having massive, though, and interesting, this is part of the French, uh, a man-made canal uh, that was part of the infrastructure system. And here you very much have a relationship of water front and urbanism. What's happening in the city, this is, well, this is in 2005. This is the kind of number of hectares of the city, and basically the kind of graphic representation. We have 60% of the area with paddy, 20% uh, urbanized, et cetera. The prediction for 2020, paddy, as you see, decreases to six. That you say the way to be modern and to urbanize, you need a lot of industry. So industry will be 29%. And then there's this strange thing called reserve land. It's not agriculture, it's just reserve. Um, very present in, in towns and, and cities. Another kind of simplification of this is what you have now, and this is what you'll have. You're getting, this is very much in the process, unfortunately. Also, a lot of problems in the delta in, in involving not only uh, rise of sea level, but also salinity intrusion, inundation also coming from, from problems of basically Chinese building dams above, um, and the population increasing in the delta. So through a study with some students in, in Oslo, um, we looked at this city. Um, and they started looking at also why have waterways been, been ignored. Um, and they started to try to understand how much it costs to build waterways, how, how much it costs to build roads. Of course, in the Mekong Delta, it costs a lot to build ro roads because the soil is so bad. Um, so they were trying to make a, an argument, not only that they wanted waterways, but that they were logical to have waterways. And then they started kind of doing some research to try to prove that about CO2 emissions and about the environmental issues. They started making, again, a lot of analysis, looking at the existing situation of the city. The city founded as a confluence of two rivers. Red is high land, and then orange is medium land, and yellow is, say, low land. And in the new master plan, this would all be red. Of course, it makes huge pockets of water. Um, so this is the existing situation of the waterways. One notion was to begin to make a kind of tube system of water, a, a Venice system with the Vaporetto kind of going around as a system of public transport. Again, creating very simple ways where you can have Sicily donate their nice boat to places where we could have a confluence of land and, and water to activate uh, the relation. Another group of students, this time in, in Leuven, started looking at kind of making a system of, of bus and, and boat together, how you're making two transport systems work, um, and kind of with the red being the bus system, the blue being the water system. And then, of course, strategic points is the crossing of the two to then start to have those as hot development spots where you start to have various kind of public playgrounds. And again, readdressing this whole waterfront um, as places where you have this kind of transport system of various, various scales. Another group looking in the, in the city. The city, uh, this is a project of the World Bank. They were basically an incredible system of housing here, very, very tight uh, housing um, that they were wanting to kind of do a slum, slum clearance project. The students tried to look at ways how you could simultaneously improve it, but at the same time increase density. So they tried to find networks and where you could do some clearance to provide systems of public space and also place where water can go. Water was always a concern, some kind of network. So there would be some slum remo removal, but at the same time, in certain places, these places they mark as purple, they would be hot spots relative to the scale of the city where you'd start to have an incredibly new density to address the problem. So you would have a kind of upgrading alongside new development, but not either one, uh, not either or, but uh, one of the two. And then looking at, at new typology and kind of technology. The idea also was in these waterways uh, to begin to think of how you could take orchards. The city is very famous for its fruit trees. How you could begin to take them to the city uh, to create public space. This is a, an area here that the city is zoned as an echo zone. Of course, you can't zone ecology. Um, but anyways, the, the students tried to look at this area and try to make a, a system. 
And they tried to use wetland parks as a way to structure urbanity. This is a group of landscape architects. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to create parks that will purify water, that have different programs. We're going to design a road system. And we just let the urbanization come. We don't care. We let the architects and the urbanists do that. So they just set the infrastructure, which was roads and water um, and public space. And so they looked at the, the way that has to work and then the way that could, could develop over time. Um, but basically developing a system where they said they don't really care about this, it will come. That the infrastructure is there. And, and again, this water system of cleaning um, is, is part of the system that was there. Can I say one more slide? Can we? Yeah? So this one is built. Uh, this is a project I will try to really quickly show for, uh, it's in, it's in Ho Chi Minh City, so now we're in the mega city of Vietnam, the money city of Vietnam, Hanoi is the capital, Saigon is the, the money capital, the global city. Saigon is the center of it, it's here, this is Solon, Chinatown, the city is now expanding to so-called District 2, very reworking in the part of a canal project with many, many international donors, of which JICA, the Japanese International Corporation, was a major organizer. And the idea was to clean this canal that had become full of um, slums. Uh, it was very dirty. And basically, as a counter proposal to this project that was made by the Vietnamese government that just kind of brutally removed everybody and built high-rise buildings, we did a pilot project. The Belgian government was very small, so it was a very small project here. And unfortunately, some of the people we had to relocate had to go here because there wasn't enough space. So this was the site before uh, the project. It was very, very um, polluted. Um, this is the kind of housing that the government was building. And this is why it's more ridiculous. The people, basically, the people who lived here were coming from the rural countryside, had a very strong connection to, to the ground, and then were, were being put. So basically, they were selling these and going over to somewhere else. This project was really not, not working. The idea was to make some kind of counter proposal. So this was the canal. This was the line that the engineers said had to be cleared in order for it to be an effective waterway and dredge. And this was a site we had, which was an agro factory that was out of commission. So we were given um, this area to basically rehouse all of these people and to deal. They wanted to, there's going to be a highway in actually the next zone that comes here. They also wanted to get rid of this slum. We found this slum actually to be very, very interesting socially, economically. We convinced them to do an upgrading project of this, the paved road. So this was one part of the project. And new houses were built here. Um, and then still some people had to be relocated in another area. This is what we ended up designing. So the new road that came, the kind of area of the project that was slum upgrading, the project was proposed to, to be perpendicular to the water to allow everybody to have some use of it. There was a hawker's market, so an informal selling place, and some public facilities here. This is what the Belgian government was able to build. The agreement was we build this and you build the rest. But the minute we finished the project and left, they said we're going to build this uh, because we get more density, more money. So. Anyway, this is built and it's standing there, and this was soon to come. And I'm sure this will soon be out. But anyway, this is the, what it was, what was designed, and what the existing. The project was very much the hawker's market. The project was very much inspired by, by someone like Werner Herzberger, the threshold space, very large uh, hallways to allow people to continue their uh, informal activities. And the, the, the housing regulation for the poor in Vietnam is only 40 per meter. So we tweeted and made it high, because they didn't talk about cubic meters. And that way, people could then make a sleeping loft um, with their own money if they would like. Um, and the idea was that along the canal, we tried to make shop front shop houses to allow kind of economy to begin. So this is the, the block that was built. So it's got the one here and then two strips. So it's a very broad staircase. Um, inside are these broad hallways, uh, open corridors, and open space below. The hawker's market, very, very simple, just basically a chajou, a few places for some refrigeration, and then basically concrete slab. And then eventually, when this will get dredged, the digits will be moved, 
is to become a place of peace and safety by both. But the other interesting part of this project is on the, 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 the relocation site to, to the north and to the northwest. Basically, we searched, and there, there's not many open spaces left in the community. So the idea was, on the one hand, to, to keep this open, and also to somehow start to upgrade this very informal housing that had almost no facilities. So we ended up building a site and services project here, like an upside down V, with a school, and basically turned this whole wetland area into, into an aerated lagoon. Um, so here is the site and services housing plots that were given the school that was built, so it was also able to serve this people. And then basically an aerated lagoon that was taking water from this very, very heavily textile polluted canal. And somehow after 11 days, you could fish it. You couldn't drink it, but they said you could, I didn't. But they said you could eat the fishes. And it basically worked with gravity over, over 11 days, having a lot to do with the intensity of the sun, which um, also very important for us was this kind of green space that we wanted to try to create to, to work with existing green space to kind of make some kind of public space in, in the city. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 fences, the fences weren't originally there, but there were some actually drowning accidents with children. Fences had to go up. But anyways, the, the relation still, I think, of the open space, the green space, and the, and the housing is, is somehow um, interesting. It's a very low-tech uh, kind of piece of pump aeration uh, that then work and create a quite a quite new um, void in the city that keeps it open, um, even if it's only as a kind of lamb bank until eventually it will be will be overrun. Um, and I will end really quickly with this. It's uh, there was an international competition, basically to counter this. This is what. Uh, Everybody in Vietnam wants, all the politicians want to be like Singapore. Uh, if they can do it, we can do it too, kind of idea. This is the reality of what's happening. They're getting all these, they have a lot of uh, cheap, a lot of people, actually very well educated people, um, but in the end, cheap labor for the international market. There's a lot of these companies just blanketing the territory. This is an international competition for, for this area, which is a, it's to be a new port city for Ho Chi Minh. The ports will be moved out of the city. This is actually our site. Um, and this is actually a UNESCO biosphere reserve. Uh, this is Canto, where we were before. So basically, this is an incredible system. This is the Mekong River that splits. So it's an incredible water system. And the port, new port city would be located there. This is our, our kind of plan, understanding the bigger story. We've got two big lakes. This is Saigon. City. What's in blue are all these industrial zones, these new industrial zones that are going to be linked to new road networks, this kind of UNESCO biosphere reserve. And basically our, our port is there. All the ports are being relocated from the city center to this river. These two have already happened. We decided to make a system of port and mangrove alternating. So to try to have a system where you have intense urbanization, but intense agriculture, mangrove, in order to work with incredible problems of flooding and water coming from the water stream above, but also coming from, from the sea itself. So the idea was to, to make a system where you alternate urbanity with mangrove, urbanity, mangrove, urbanity. So the system became for us very simple in a way. We took the airport and we made an urban port. We literally made a red line, which is going to be the first public tram line of, of Saigon that the French would donate. Uh, this is Saigon South, a big new development area. This is the reunification palace. So our trajectory basically followed the existing city structure and ended in a kind of place. The idea being that this isn't just a port city with workers, but a place where you could take your children on the weekends to and to have the port of the city, a place where you could be closer to the sea. So we traced the trajectory in the city, this nice French tram uh, that would come along and, and work as a, as a system. Um, this is the famous reunification palace, and there's plenty of room for, for a tram. The system, the, the, the system was made 
basically we, we, we said we can't make a plan. In, in Vietnam, they still make master plans. We said a plan is ridiculous. We can't plan anything. We're just completely reliant on policies from the front of me that's not so stable. Um, but you can make scenarios with, with strategies. So we worked with the Vietnamese team, and they, they didn't buy it completely. So we made strategies, and they translated our strategies to a plan with two, two extras. Uh, this is a little funny collaboration, but the basic idea of our type was to have a series of the landscapes that transform over time, also in scale. So you have the huge kind of hard mineral surface of the quartz, so the extra large. You have, of course, the, the mangroves. And then in between, you have a series of other landscapes, one that's very rural and fits into the existing urbanization that you have, and then the urban one that's tied to the red line of the tram. And then between the orange and the red is an, is an in-between that maybe will become more orange or maybe will become more red or maybe will simply remain red or maybe will remain green. Very simple system of infrastructure, kind of port infrastructure, the red line and a local road. And then some strategic projects to get the whole thing moving. So there was a British company that was actually the founding of this whole competition because they wanted a container port. So that was going to be the container terminal here. This would be an afforestation program. The urban port, a system of wetlands, a large park, and then a series of public programs attached to the red line of the public transport. And then basically scenarios. So if you have, if the port really goes more, you have much more orange. If the urban system goes, you have more red. And if you get a balanced system, you have something in between. The idea is then everywhere you should have a mixture, not a monofunctional, but you should have a mixture of what they have now with other scales, other kinds of fabric coexisting. Very much a structure was the water system, so a water purification system for the industry, where every industry has to clean their own water before they dump it into a bigger system, before it then goes through a chemical and then goes into a water. And then a system also of um, um, constructed wetlands, at the, at the, say, urban scale and then at the, say, rural scale. That would work in, in different ways where they also become park places, but also on, say, urban platforms. Platforms meaning this is where you add two or three meters of soil. Otherwise, you remain on the low, the low line. So you end up getting a stream. Well, what's gray is this high land. Um, so that this is the, all the port area, the urban area. So this is a scenario where the port really takes off, but not the urban. Then where the urban maybe takes more off or where you get something a little bit more, more balanced. So the idea is these platforms are simply raised earth, then you let urbanization happen, and the infrastructure and the wetlands guide the system of how things get urbanized, um, and you have different projects that, that come. And for us, this was a nice, um, I think, example. This one particularly is nice that you, on the one hand, have the mangroves, the monkeys, um, but still with the industry. So you have a very rich, instead of monofunctional, this is the usual way things are in, in this type of place. This was the, so we made, the, we being the university, a, la, a Belgian architecture group called WIT, and Proop, a landscape architect from Portugal. The three of us worked together to make what I just showed you. And this was then translated by our Vietnamese counterpart into the master plan that was required. Um, and we got second place, and this is the one that won by Nikan Sekei that wins almost everything in Hanoi, I mean Saigon. Uh, this is, what, this is what, what won. So I'll end with this. Um, for me, it's, it's my attempt, very much work, working attempt to try to understand what is landscape urbanism, what should be landscape urbanism. For me, it's, as you see, very much about reading um, and then starting to design potential, understand existing logic, going constantly at different scales, and really trying to not just record everything, because there's a lot of junk, but trying to see the logic, specific logic that can guide something and that can structure something. And, and finally, for me, also design in our role and landscape urbanism, because it became disciplined, because it put things on the table, can really become a way we can negotiate and resolve conflict. And I always end with this, which I take completely out of context. Uh, but um, so of course.
course, when Freud was talking about Las Vegas, but I take it a little more literally, not romantically, but learning from the Egyptian landscape is a way we can resist the kind of generic cities and storehouses of the world and become more what we can. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to, to start by thanking you very much for a, a kind of fantastic and fantastically interesting lecture and some, uh, you know, just some great and very kind of stimulating projects that you showed there. Um, I have a question which I'd like to hold off because it's kind of like a big generic question about landscape urban. Um, but do we have any questions before I kind of launch into that? I thought the Belgian students were shy of this subject. Well, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, the IMF, I mean, they're banks. They like to give loans, big loans, infrastructure, and for roads. I mean, there are, are, we have been, our students, myself, our research, researchers in the university have been trying to kind of bring to the table facts, numbers for, for water-based transport, for instance, public transport. And the Vietnamese, many of them are also now getting interested in this idea. But on the, in, I think in the Vietnamese context, for instance, it's, it's kind of double or it's got many sides, right? Because also road-based urbanism is somehow a symbol of modernity, progress, moving forward, right? Whether we like it or not, and we can now reflect and say, no, it's not. But of course it is and has always been. So there's a kind of general, I think, uh, attitude um, that first has to be, to be understood and debated. But then the banks are pushing for road-based transport. They're, they're not almost never pushing for, for water-based urbanization and water-based uh, transport, which is much cheaper. It does have sense, but it's simply, I mean, banks aren't looking for what's cheaper, right? So they're looking, <laughs> in, in my opinion. That, I mean, the conflict is very much one about driven by Of course. Roads. Yes, of course. Not much. No, I mean the same, I think that's global. Um, but, it, but in fact, and what's happening, sadly, is more and more, I mean, waterways are simply being covered by asphalt in some cases. Right? I, for, for me also, I showed the example of the Netherlands before. Um, there, there was a very interesting lecture I saw a few two years ago by a Dutch professor. He was talking about, he had the exact same picture of some canals in, in, in Utrecht, of how there was, a, there was a, a wonderful canal, it was full of water transport, even water-based living. It was then turned into a road. And that same place now <laughs> is being dug up again and remade as water. So it's, it's perhaps a cycle that everybody has to go through to recognize the intelligence or not, but uh, it's there rarely being fought institutionally. So the, the idea of roads as a way to the future, cars are it. I mean, there's not a big car population now in Vietnam, but it's coming, right? I mean, now with the, the nano car, uh, it's going to put cars everywhere. Um, so, so it's, still it's a symbol. Everybody wants a car. Huh? When will the Honda ride truck? 
Because, um, I mean, obviously, for us, the way I can say I work, I work with uh, my colleagues, and the way we try to work with our students is what you're saying, that, ma I mean, this kind of big big plan, big big thinking of the 20th century somehow has failed. I mean, it's maybe not a too strong a word, but had big problems. Um, and especially in a context like Vietnam, where they still make master plans, no? Every, every five years, they have a party congress, they make projections that are often wild views, economic projections, socio-economic projections that are then translated to a land use plan where they say we know the future, we fixed it. So of course this is trying to get away from that, um, but it remains at the territorial scale and large scale structuring, but trying, the, the idea is that the structures are trying to be the scale of ecologies and, and landscapes so that if you un can understand, and that's also where we have to admit a bit naive, and now we're starting to work more with hydrologists and people who are knowing, uh, that we try to make s structures that are not so much imposing land use and programs, but trying to set up um, an infrastructure of a landscape that can take if a project comes or doesn't come. So we try to, the thing we try to develop, which still needs, I mean, it falls into, the, it's not an answer to your question, but it is a direct criticism, but trying to develop more scenarios and visions that remain somehow loose, but then finding a few strategic places where you can intervene to fit and to make that thing possible, knowing that, so that the principle of the vision is, is somehow, the principle is there, but its form will can and will change. But the principle, I mean, in the hip book, the last project I showed, trying to say that, I mean, instead of the principle of what they are going to build there eventually, instead of just filling it three meters high earth, which is the plan, to turn it all into a kind of mineral surface, the principle is try to create places where you have platforms, places where you have lowland, places where you have systems coming and going, is it still too dictating and too much trying to find the vision? Pro probably. I mean, that's probably always going to be the, the fault of us who try to organize the territory. No? That's somehow our, I think that's the paradox of how can you not do too much and not make a big plan, but if you want to structure something that's not just a one-off, it is about a large infrastructure, landscape structure. So I, I think it is a probably circular, paradoxical notion, but I, I think you're, you're very right that we probably have to go back and still wonder how far is this uh, yet another variation of a big plan. So I, it's not really an answer, but I think it's a fair question for myself. So, yeah. No, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to add to that, that I, I think the perspective often of people looking at 
landscape urbanism's way of doing things, its way of diagramming and mapping, is to kind of think, well, isn't this that same kind of megalomania about wanting to control things at such a huge scale? But, you know, as I, under as I understand it, landscape urbanism is, is addressing uh, an existing scale. It's addressing the knowledge that things work at that scale, that we know that ecology works at that scale. You can't just think of it as scale one. Social ecology works on the same basis as well. So you are always, even if you make a small intervention, it's that's always going to have a larger impact. So, yeah, that's kind of the way I understand it as well, that you can still need to sort of control things at that scale, but it's understanding things at that scale in order to make particular interventions as well. Um, my question is... I, th I thought it was kind of an interesting summing up you did of, of from your energy point of view of, you know, what is landscape urbanism. Um, but given that you were talking about strategy quite a lot, and that other speakers in this series have also spoken about strategy, and that inevitably most of, you know, what we do and the, the new types of projects we show don't get built, then thinking about, well, what do those projects do and what is the practice of landscape urbanism? if it is kind of constantly about proposing alternative scenarios, then what it does. And I'm just wondering, you know, what your experience is in terms of, you know, perhaps saying to the people who do make the decisions, that, you know, do you, do you see something that landscape urbanism is, is doing and being able to say, okay, well, here's an alternative proposal. Um, is, it, is it about kind of offering an alternative vision to that that's you know, an open world in a way? Well, actually, for me, I mean, when I'm in... Vietnam, I've ne I never speak about landscape urbanism, right. I've never heard of such a term. Working with the logic of, of the water and the land that they've been doing for forever. Um, so that's where I think it's an entry. But for me, the also because I am full-time employed in the university, uh, the one project that did get built was with a group of other people. For, for me, projects, landscape urbanism, um, the kind of more projective projects, for me, they're not so much about making actual or even making the alternative, but they're really about asking, it's about raising questions and putting stuff on the, on the table for debate and for negotiation. Because for me also, I mean, as much as I can myself with my students, we try also with the privilege of being an outsider to see something, because sometimes you can see what the locals take for granted. Um, but of course, you never know, and you're always naive, and you're always a little bit stupid. Um, but I think our role, my role, but also when I speak to the students, is we try to come with, with questions. So the design is, a, is, a, is not an answer, but is a question. As a kind of way to rethink. And putting this on the table, I've found through time with, with Vietnamese, after, after many years, actually, um, starts to, to work as a, uh, we're asked to do more and more things, still always in the speculative <laughs> side, the research side, but, but by national institutions, they're interested in the idea of can we try to, the national, it's called VIAP, the Vietnamese Institute of Architecture and Planning, is interested in trying to, to make a, a study about water-based public transport. I mean, they also are interested in the idea of how can we make this balance between cut and fill. It sounds very stupid and silly, but it's never really, how can we sell that to a developer that it will help him in the long run, no? So, so this stuff for me is um, not so much alternatives, but really kind of reframing questions and trying to, to help a debate. In a place that's not having a lot of time for questioning, no? I mean, they're, they're moving so fast, the opportunity is there, there's money to be made, there's politics that are in, inescapable. So you have to do it or you don't survive in the system. So the kind of margin of, of questioning, I think, is something that, that kind of outsiders and, and speculative projects can bring. When it's drawn also, I mean, when some of these, these projects, actually the reason I, this monkey thing I, for me was, and we had a guy in Belgium who was drawing this, but the Vietnamese went crazy about this. They never imagined that we could have a monkey. I mean, for them, this was to put on the table and they translated in Vietnamese. They thought it was the most funny, interesting thing they saw. I mean, this was, this was for them something that they never in their lives thought to even think to do this. For them, this was supposed to be a worker's place, a port, kind of dirty, kind of end-of-the-world place that's not uh, human, certainly not sort of monkey. 
so I think uh, it's not that this is uh, the an answer project that should be built, I think.